Hello, Lee. Okay, are we are we all in? Michelle, are we all in now? Um, we've got the Commissioner, Peter Curran, Umar Hussain, Lee Jones, Victoria Madeline, Richard Watkins. That's that's who we've got with us now. Can I ask the, the commissioner then, is, is everybody that he is uh, bringing to the meeting actually here? Uh, I believe so, yes. Um, I, I didn't realise that Omar Hussain was joining us, but that's a bonus. Um, uh, the, um, I didn't think it was necessary to have the chief constable <coughs> on this occasion uh, because of the nature of the, of the agenda. Um, uh, so I think we're all present and correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Commissioner. <clears throat> On that basis, can I welcome everybody to the meeting of the South Wales Police and Crime Panel? Um, and just a, a couple of housekeeping things, if I may. Can I ask everybody that is not uh, required to speak at the time to uh, mute their mics, please, because that will help us with the background noise. Um, during the reports, can I ask if anybody wishes to uh, uh, make a comment, if they raise their hands? Uh, you can see the hand, raise your hand icon in the bar on your screen, uh, or uh, put in the meeting chat box that you wish to speak, and I'll bring you in, and I will bring you in in the order that I uh, it appears on my screen. Um, I think it is fair to say, Commissioner, that we have a very heavy agenda today. So on that basis, what I think we need to do is to, on certain reports, not the important ones obviously, but on certain reports, we've already had those reports and had the opportunity to read them. So I'm going to ask the presenter to do a very, very swift presentation on those reports. Uh, I think it's possible that those that want to ask uh, questions on those items have already formed questions that they wish to ask, if there are any questions. So I'm, I'm looking, in actual fact, Commissioner, to your assistance in this, in asking the presentations to be as, as swift as possible. Uh, is that okay and acceptable with you? I think you muted, uh, Commissioner. See, I'm so obedient. Um, I think there are two items which uh, probably uh, would uh, take a, a bit of time. One is the uh, the update on COVID, because uh, uh, given that things are um, so fast moving, um, it was proposed that that uh, that I should give a verbal update uh, uh, on uh, uh, an oversight of that. And then secondly, uh, Peter Curran, We'll give a presentation on the uh, finances, uh, which are complex. The other items, uh, uh, I, I think, on each of them, we can uh, probably start just with a very few words, as you suggest, and then go straight to questions from members. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. I thank you for your uh, indulgence on that. Uh, can I also um, say to to uh, people, I've already asked you to uh, mute your mics, um, I'm quite happy for individuals in the interests of reducing the bands with, with while they're not speaking to um, uh, switch off their videos as well. Okay. Can I uh, also ask uh, um, individuals if, if um, they then, when, when they speak, when they introduce themselves as this is being recorded for the benefit of the recording, I simply need them to say their name and their position. Uh, and with that, thank you so much. I will move on to the first item. <clears throat> so, can I have the apologies for absence, please? 
Chair, apologies for absence have been received from Ian Fox, co-optee, and Emma Wills from the Commissioner's Office. Thank you, Michelle. Now, does anybody know of any other absences, or has anybody got an announcement of having to leave the meeting early? No? No, no. Thank you. I'll take it on. Can I ask, uh, do any members or uh, officers have uh, any declarations of interest? If they do have, please can they indicate? Hi, hi um, it's Councillor Bowen Thompson. Just to declare an interest, I run a charity called Safer Wales and we receive funding from the Commissioner's Office. Thank you for that. Any other declarations of interest? Yeah, Chair, I, I'm also a non-executive uh, trustee with Safer Merthyr Tidville, and that also is involved in uh, remuneration and funding from the Commissioner's Office, I believe. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Any others? No, thank you. So, item four of the minutes of the meeting on Thursday the 4th of June 2020 of the South Wales Police and crying panel. Can I ask someone to move? Anyone? I move, Chair. Move uh, uh, Graham Thomas, RCT. Thank you, Graham. Are there any matters arising from those uh, minutes? <clears throat> no, thank you so much. On that basis, Commissioner, um, if you would like to introduce the first report of COVID-19 update. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, uh, I'm going to speak about the um, how we have moved through the, the uh, period of uh, the COVID impact of COVID-19, uh, really picking up uh, from the early report that we gave at the last meeting. Um, Lee Jones will speak about the accountability and scrutiny elements, although, of course, that's also picked up in our annual report, which uh, comes later. And uh, uh, Peter Curran is here to deal with the finances. And again, I think probably the sensible thing is to concentrate those considerations um, uh, at the time of uh, Peter's presentation uh, rather than on the, uh, the COVID-19 report. Um, uh, I want to give uh, uh, a particular word of thanks to the members of my team, because uh, as for so many people across the public service, this has been an extra extraordinary period of time. Uh, and I think it's quite remarkable that uh, even though many members of the team, some of them are quite uh, young and have young families, uh, and therefore they've had the, uh, the pressures of working for home um, with children very often contributing uh, in unexpected ways to various meetings. Um, the, uh, the fact is that the work that we do as a team, uh, the promotion of preventative interventions and all the rest of it, <clears throat> certainly hasn't slackened uh, during uh, the last six months. In, in fact, in some ways, it's, it's actually exact, um, uh, accelerated. Um, just to give a couple of examples, uh, domestic violence and violence against women and girls, uh, the whole of that domestic violence and abuse agenda was a matter of real worry. Uh, and as we said at the last meeting, the chief constable uh, and I went to some uh, trouble to promote the fact that people shouldn't fail to report uh, just because the period of, uh, uh, of COVID was, uh, was upon us. It's interesting that whereas reporting uh, of incidents uh, did go down uh, and there was a great concern about the hidden harms that might be going on when people were forced to stay uh, in the house together for a, for a period. Um, the level of arrests in South Wales has remained at its normal level, which rather suggests that where reports are made, uh, that South Wales Police have been working very vigorously to make sure they responded uh, appropriately. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we received additional money uh, from the government uh, and therefore Paula Hardy, the victim's lead, 
uh, and that team have worked very hard to get those resources out to the voluntary organisations within uh, with which we work in order to make support on things again like dom domestic violence and use and abuse, child abuse and so on, uh, were used fully and that uh, we didn't see some of our most vulnerable uh, citizens losing out as a result of the uh, impact of the of the pandemic. Um, I reported last time of our intentions in relation to drive, uh, which is the um, challenging and interventions with perpetrators, particularly the most serious perpetrators of domestic violence. Um, that, uh, as we planned, has been extended out from uh, Mirtha and RCT and Safer Mirtha, uh, which Mel mentioned, uh, has been a terrific partner in this work uh, to Bridgend uh, and also from Cardiff into the Vale of Glamorgan. Uh, and we remain on track uh, to provide the drive service uh, in Swansea and Neath Port Talbot uh, starting this month. This is of significance because we are the only force in the country uh, that has been so ambitious in terms of intervention with perpetrators and stopping harm uh, happening in the first place. It doesn't reduce our emphasis on meeting the needs of victims, uh, but it does emphasise our determination uh, to work with operational policing and with all our partners uh, for there to be fewer uh, victims and less harm uh, in the first place. So that has been very challenging. And as I say, I want to pay tribute to the way that members of my uh, team have found ways of getting on with work, of continuing to develop the strategies which we've reported to the panel on a number of occasions uh, and to get things done. Uh, another very important example is the development of the interventions on uh, substance misuse in Swansea and Neath Port Talbot. Uh, I think members of the panel will recall that Swansea and Neath Port Talbot have the two highest levels of drug deaths in England and Wales, other than Blackpool. Blackpool is the only place where the deaths per 100,000 uh, exceed those. Uh, and I have to say that in a number of areas of South Wales, the figures are not very hard, far behind. Nevertheless, with the declaration of a critical incident in Swansea and Neath Port Talbot, we have seen good partnership working. And during the course of the pandemic, uh, the substance misuse lead, uh, Josie Smith from uh, Public Health Wales and Angharad Metcalf, my uh, substance misuse lead, uh, have produced and then consulted uh, on a document which sets out plans for uh, a, a much improved service and really challenging uh, the uh, situation that we face at the moment uh, in both of those areas. I think it'll have implications more widely and we'll actually be making a report to the Policing Board for Wales, which is chaired by the First Minister uh, this Thursday. Uh, and I think it's, a, uh, it's of some significance. And as I say, that, has, uh, that work has been continued. Uh, and indeed, once things settled down during the pandemic, we've had really strong engagement uh, from the chair, the chief executive and the director of public health uh, in Swansea Bay Health Board uh, and from Public Health Wales, recognising that this is one of the biggest harms that faces all our communities across South Wales. And we couldn't afford uh, the impact of the pandemic, which has been enormous, obviously, uh, to get in the way of us continuing to, uh, to develop that work. I think the third example of the resilience we've shown is in relation to courts. Um, the fact that courts were closed for six months in effect uh, has had a big impact because it creates a backlog. It's not just the fact that cases aren't dealt with. Uh, victims have to be supported and it's very worrying for victims when uh, a case doesn't come to court for a long period of time. So uh, I've both made representations on behalf of uh, policing and the criminal justice system in Wales to the Lord Chancellor and actually had a very positive response from him. And we've driven uh, some work to uh, not only reopen the courts, uh, but to get additional courts, uh, what was called initially a Nightingale court and then subsequently a, a Blackstone court, uh, is one of the 10 in England and Wales that opened in Swansea. Uh, City Hall in Cardiff is being used for uh, from next week for the 
marshalling of juries, which will allow the opening of a further three courts in Cardiff. And work is going on in Swansea to try to make it suitable for multi-hander uh, cases. That's cases with numerous defendants who are uh, held in custody uh, to be heard in those those premises. That couldn't have happened with the, without the partnership they ha we have with the court service, the Crown Prosecution Service in Wales. The help of local authorities, uh, particularly uh, Swansea and Cardiff, uh, and uh, in general, the sort of sense of doing things together and determination to improve things. Uh, it's been acknowledged last week, for instance, by the courts minister, uh, when he had a meeting with commissioners from across England and Wales, he just made the comment, it seems to be that they're better at getting things done in Wales. Um, uh, that, that, I think, is a, a reasonable acknowledgement. And people like uh, Eddie O and uh, uh, Danny Richards, chief superintendent in South Wales Police, have been enormously uh, uh, helpful in the impact that they've made uh, in this sort of joint works. I hope you don't mind me... <coughs> pointing to those examples of, uh, of good development because uh, they are significant. They really make a difference and they will make the difference uh, to people's lives, <clears throat> including uh, the victims um, of offences. As far as operational policing is concerned, um, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the response that our police officers, our PCSOs, uh, and indeed the support from other staff has been exemplary in South Wales. Uh, the message has been given nationally that the uh, en enforcement essentially is the last resort and that the first thing that the police have to do is to engage the public, to explain what the rules are and why it is that they've been put in place, whether by national government or Welsh government, to encourage people to stick to the rules and then only to use enforcement as a, a last resort, but to have no hesitation in using it when it's needed. Um, I think it, uh, it's a tribute to the normal approach to work of South Wales Police and the standards that have been set uh, by Matt Jukes and Jeremy Vaughan as his deputy and Jenny Gilmer as the person in charge of uh, uh, the operations, territorial policing on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, that actually it was the natural way of doing things. Uh, therefore, the uh, enforcement, which very often is with the same disorganised or disrupted characters uh, that we have to deal with at other times, uh, was kept to a minimum, um, but there was a maximum impact. And the support in communities across South Wales has been enormous from, for the police in the way they've done their job. Nowhere was that more to be seen uh, than in Banwen, where we had one of the uh, most difficult situations across the whole of England Wales with thousands of people uh, coming to the old open cast mine uh, for a rave. Very, very difficult territory to police at night uh, in order to deal with that. No advance warning because it had been arranged through uh, encrypted systems on social media. Um, and the community of, of Banwin, of course, were um, very, very angry about what had happened, but very, very supportive and cooperative with the police, the rugby club and uh, elected members there. Uh, I had regular contact with the uh, MP, the assembly member and uh, uh, the local councillor as that was uh, was progressing. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's it's an example of the unexpected things that have had a big impact uh, on the uh, challenges, uh, challenging of, of, of policing, but which have been uh, responded to uh, very well uh, indeed. Um, it, the figures in the uh, report uh, are a little out of date uh, in the sense that, uh, as we've seen August progress into September, the business as usual of crime and calls on the police uh, have continued to rise. And I think some weekends uh, have been like uh, New Year's day in terms of the number of, uh, of calls. Uh, but of course, the demand in terms of COVID and the explanation of new rules and the encouragement of people to stick to those rules um, has continued. I was very pleased by the First Minister's announcement uh, last, at the end of last week um, on the uh, uh, what I would describe as simplification of the requirements on face masks, uh, because I think there was beginning to be a bit of uncertainty. Why, why would face masks be important on public transport 
uh, and in the Kafili area uh, and not be uh, uh, encouraged elsewhere. Uh, but as ever, it's the public recognising that this is being brought in, not to be uh, onerous, but uh, because it's in everybody's, uh, uh, the interest of everybody's health and protecting both the NHS and our own health, um, that, uh, that it's happening. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, I think the simplicity of the messages we found through this period, simple messages really do uh, help. Um, that has made it problematic when we've had uh, changes in regulation. Uh, as one council leader said to me uh, when we were uh, coping with one uh, set of changes in relation to pubs, for instance, uh, it's a lot easier to close things down than it is to open them back up again. And of course, big variations uh, compared to some pubs with big car parks where you could uh, have uh, social distancing outside and then others, uh, as for instance, in RCT, uh, where uh, many of the uh, of the pubs open straight onto a very narrow, narrow footpath, and therefore there are different considerations in terms of public expectation and the dangers of people uh, and their behaviour uh, when they've had a drink or two. Um, so um, the um, the the partnership working. Uh, with Welsh Government and with local government has been exemplary. We've tried to have sessions with council leaders, uh, members of parliament and uh, members of the Senate on a regular basis. Uh, and again, the feedback we've had from those has been very uh, positive indeed. I referred to the challenge of events in Banwen, but there have been others more local. Um, the ones that hit the headlines uh, were uh, uh, Ogmore, uh, where there was a lot of uh, challenging behaviour by young people, shall we just put it that way, um, uh, exacerbated by problems over car parks uh, and some car parks not opening. That meant there was a concentration into Ogmore. But it's not dissimilar to the challenges that have been experienced in places like SA2 in Swansea, uh, in Mumbles and so on. Uh, again, uh, cooperation with the Vailable Morgan Council uh, I had discussions there again and exchanges with the uh, the members of member of the Senate, the uh, the MP, uh, and with uh, council uh, representatives to try to make sure that we kept things to um, uh, a minimum. Uh, and the final one I'll mention is uh, Cardiff Bay, which hit the headlines uh, in terms of the behaviour of people. I think a lot of that was because the nighttime economy. Uh, was taken outside from the well-controlled bars uh, of uh, South Wales. And some people were a bit a bit surprised by the uh, raucous behaviour that uh, took place. Actually, it remained very safe. Um, we do pride ourselves on the fact that Cardiff is probably the safest city of its size and compared with many much larger cities in England um, because of all the work that's gone on to reduce violence uh, over the over the years. Uh, and the way in which, uh, when problems arose, uh, the council and the operational police team got together to address it, to put uh, new measures in place and so on, um, was exemplary and really reflects the level of cooperation that there has been uh, with uh, uh, between local authorities and peace, policing right across uh, South Wales. Um, I think the final thing I'd just touch on is the reference to the South Wales Local Resilience Forum. Um, the uh, system for dealing with emergencies that comes out of the uh, Resilience Forum arrangements with the um, uh, strategic uh, coordination group coming into place on a South Wales police basis, as with every, every other police force area, was exemplary and it worked really well. I'm not sure that the recovery uh, coordination group arrangements are um, as robust. And, th and the reason for that is that when it came to recovery, basically it came to uh, the local police with uh, the leadership of the local authority in each case across our seven local authorities across South Wales in, in engagement with other power partners um, to deal with the challenges of, uh, of opening things up. Things didn't happen on a South Wales basis uh, and uh, um, you know, nobody apart from South Wales Police actually operates on that full South Wales footprint. So uh, I think there's a need for some consideration as we come out of this 
uh, of a different way of dealing with this sort of emergency to what happens when there's an, a normal emergency like a flood or, or um, you know, the other things we're used to dealing with. It's not the first time this has uh, been a consideration for me because I was the Minister of State for Rural Affairs responsible for rural England in recovery uh, uh, from 2001. And it was similar there because you you need to work on the places where there is, is local accountability, which is the local council, uh, and where the systems of day-to-day uh, -day functioning need to go back to normal. And of course, there are differences between uh, the arrangements in different uh, areas of South Wales. My final uh, point is that uh, on the 7th of September, uh, the change was made to move from four basic command units, four BCUs, uh, across South Wales to three. Uh, so uh, the new basic command units are Cardiff and the Vale, uh, it, it, covering those two local authority areas and on the footprint of the health board, of course. Um, the uh, Midler Morgan uh, BCU, which covers uh, uh, Merthyr, RCT, uh, and Bridge End, again on the uh, relatively new footprint uh, of the health board there, as well as those three local authorities. And the third one that stays on the same footprint, which is uh, Swansea and Neath Patalbert. But in that case, uh, of course, the changes that have been integrated into this move from four to three uh, on improving the standard of investigation, uh, uh, streamlining teamwork, and making sure that the support remains there for the bit that hasn't changed, which is the local neighbourhood policing teams, uh, is uh, is strengthened. All of that has uh, been a big piece of work led by uh, ACC Jenny Gilmer uh, very successfully uh, into completion uh, and delivery. So I hope that gives a little bit of a picture of what has been an incredibly busy time. I thought that uh, when COVID struck, uh, being confined to home was going to mean that I'd have hours every day uh, to put my feet up and do a bit of reading and listen to music uh, instead of spending time driving to Neath and Merthyr and Bridge End and uh, a, a day a week normally in uh, in London. It hasn't been like that. It's been wall to wall. And that's partly been uh, because we've uh, tried to respond with uh, the chief constable and his team to everything thrown at us in terms of policing but also because we've continued to drive those early interventions and preventions and improvements that I referred to at one or two places within uh, my report. And we will continue to do that as we run uh, into uh, into the, the autumn. Uh, my final point, but I think it's probably, uh, uh, sorry, it's a second final point. Um, uh, it'll probably be better picked up later with the report on accountability uh, and uh, uh, Lee Jones will um, uh, major on that element is that we have kept up the scrutiny, uh, the accountability, the audit committee, the um, ethics committee and things like that uh, during uh, this period. So there has been no slackening of the uh, scrutiny and the work with the chief constable to make sure that there is continual improvement, um, not least responding to the Black Lives Matter campaign as an opportunity to do uh, even better than the improvements we've seen uh, in uh, the last couple of years in terms of uh, Black and BAME uh, recruitment um, and moving on into uh, retention and, and progression and making sure that we make a contribution uh, to the uh, community cohesion that is essential for every one of our communities. Of course, not only uh, in relation to, uh, to race, uh, but uh, many other issues uh, that are important to social confusion and protection of the vulnerable uh, as well. I hope that's helpful, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have uh, two indications for questions, Commissioner. So can I call Councillor Cowan, please, followed by uh, Councillor Richards. Councillor Cowan. Okay. Thank you. You've asked us to give our name. My name's Jane Cowan and I'm a panel member. Thank you very much for the presentation. Can I just first put on record my thanks and appreciations to two officers? May not be appropriate in the public domain, but I, I think that they need the recognition. Um, we've got a new inspector called Judith Martin. She has been above and beyond what she needs to do 
in her role as a police um, officer, always available, really gets on top of the issue and has really been a great asset and uh, helps the community. And also PCSO Stephen Westlake. Um, he's a local officer. And again, he does so much more than his job description and he's a real asset to the force. So please pass back my thanks and appreciation um, when the opportunity arises. It's just a couple of questions, really. Um, looking at the core demands, and I was quite surprised to see a reduction. But do these figures take into consideration also things like Facebook messages, Twitter messages, or emails to the Public Service Centre? That's a very efficient way of logging things. I've used that um, more so recently, and I've been promoting that in the community. You get a really quick uh, response, whereas 101 sometimes can be a little bit problematic. Um, the email response has been uh, very, very good. Uh, and two further points, if you can beg my indulgence. Um, one is to do with whistleblowers. Um, people who are whistleblowing, people who are allegedly breaching the COVID regulations. I'm in receipt of um, some communication and I don't know whether or not we're being harsh enough team with people. You know, at the end of the day, there's people's lives at risk. And I'm just wondering what your views on whether or not we need to kind of um, ramp it up a gear to deal with um, the perpetrators, particularly with what's happened, um, you know, with the rule of six, which is coming this week. Um, and the last point was, um, I understand that some police officers are struggling to get the COVID tests. And I'm just wondering um, if there's any uh, anything that we're doing to make sure they can receive them as soon as possible. Because obviously we're a key frontline service and our officers need to be there on the street patrolling and also they need to safeguard their family and their colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um do you want me to respond to those, Richard, or do you want the other question first? No, I'm happy for you to respond to that at the moment. Right. Um, firstly, thank you for referring to the two officers. Um, uh, that will certainly be passed uh, back to the Chief Constable and the um, uh, the, the uh, local commander in Cardiff. Uh, and I think I will take it, if you don't mind, Jane, uh, as being uh, an illustration uh, of what happens uh, at the local level right across South Wales. Um, yes, but but it's it's always nice to have uh, uh, individuals named because it does come down to the individual responsibility of individual officers to provide uh, that service. So it's uh, it's nice for them to be thanked. Um, the 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 second thing, uh, <clears throat> I, I'm a little bit um, puzzled about the the drop towards the end of the uh, calls received because it doesn't quite fit with my understanding. Um, from that period on. So I, that's why I said uh, in my in my remarks that I think these figures are a bit out of date because as we went into the bank holiday and the beginning of September, uh, which of course is fallen off the right hand end of uh, uh, of the of the graph, uh, certainly we were getting uh, 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 calls at a level that were uh, far above the normal rather than uh, rather than dropping down. So um, I, I think. Um, we will supplement this report for members of the panel and uh, follow it up with a with a note afterwards, uh, if, if that's OK. Um, and um, the uh, uh, you asked whether the social media and email uh, reports, but certainly if they're reports, they would be uh, counted in the figures because they would contribute to the demand. I think sometimes some of the social media and email, email communications are a bit vaguer. Um, so I'll have a look at that and um, uh, provide some update on it, because obviously those sorts of ways of reporting are comparatively new, and it is important that the uh, statistics reflect them. Um, whistleblowers on COVID, I think, I think it depends uh, whether it's on the seriousness of the event, like anything else, uh, you know, report about noise from neighbors and things like that. <coughs> Sometimes the issue is a one to be dealt with by the local authority. There was a bit of misunderstanding, I think, uh, that some people thought that, for instance, when there were uh, challenges uh, in relation to uh, into bars and clubs, that there'd be police officers going into every venue. And it, those issues are really best dealt with by licensing with police as support and police dealing when it's a public order issue or uh, when a fracas breaks out because there's an argument over um, uh, obedience to the rules. So I think it's, uh, in fairness, a, a matter of judgment, but certainly where, uh, where there are, you know, house parties that are flouting the rule and clearly going to pro, uh, 
um, produce a public health uh, risk as well as um, vastly increasing uh, the uh, the nuisance in the local area, uh, then those incidents are um, re responded to. Um, as far as um, COVID tests are concerned, um, um, the most recent, and it's some time ago that I had, uh, was that actually that had been uh, ironed out and that, that uh, tests were being uh, obtained as needed within South Wales Police. If there are any specific examples, I'd be happy to take them uh, take them up and I, I will also make the inquiry as to whether there's been uh, any issues of late but my understanding was that the uh, the the issues that we did have uh, were were ironed out and overcome it was raised with me yesterday just for clarity okay well if you could give me the specific example privately then I'd be happy to pick that up thank you Jane okay thank you thank, thank you for that thank you commissioner i got two more indications of people wanting to speak uh, so i will call councillor richards in in a minute followed by councillor evans and and and, and councillor thomas after councillor evans i uh, just a query i noticed there's a hands up i on my screen i have a, a little round uh, dot with plus eight in it and i think it's a member of your team Alan, and I've got a hands up against that, but I've got no name against it. So I'm wondering, is someone from your team indicating that they want to speak? I don't know. I'm trying to have a look. I'll look while we hear the next question, if I may. Yeah, that's fine. OK, that's great. So in that case, then, Councillor Richards. OK, thank you, Chair. And thank you for your report, Commissioner. Um, uh, just just a, a couple of questions, really. And uh, and observations just to back up really what uh, what uh, Jane said previously about local officers being very visible and uh, being very supportive within our sorry yeah being very supportive with it with within our communities. I know certainly in our little neck of the woods there was talk of um, a, a mass gathering of young people um and hordes coming across like a bridge from you know from from david powers but um that that didn't happen but certainly local police officers were in attendance and dealt with the situation very well my my question and i only have one question because i think you've covered quite quite a lot this morning is about what you said about the drive project coming to uh coming to swansea um, I'm delighted to hear that uh, that that's happening because I think the work with perpetrators is perhaps, uh, you know, a, a very, you know, is clearly a very important part of, of the work that needs to be done to, um, you know, to, to in the fight against domestic uh, abuse. I was just wondering, uh, who are you going to be working with? Because there are, um, are, are you are, are you setting up links with um, the organisations? within Swansea. Um, I know certainly we've got our own council hub, but there are other um, uh, organisations as well. And so I was just wondering really about the nitty gritty of how that project is going to work in practical terms. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Uh, can I say, um, I don't think there's anybody from uh, my team looking uh, to uh, come in chair, uh, but um, Lee Jones uh, will be able to say a little bit more about uh, the more recent aspects of demand, which might be helpful. Uh, I think the plus eight is just that there are more uh, more people who aren't on your list rather than they're, uh, they're, they're meant to be hands up, uh, 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 if that's helpful. Um, as far as driving uh, Swansea is concerned, yes, very much uh, in conjunction with the local authority and uh, local voluntary organisations and Paula Hardy in uh, Who's, who's the lead for me has been uh, in contact with uh, with those organisations. I reported our intentions uh, to uh, a meeting of the Public Services Board. Um, I can't remember whether it was December or January now, but anyway, before COVID kicked in, um, and uh, I was very encouraged by the positive response that was was given. Yeah. In particular, the uh, uh, the leader of the council. Um, uh, raise the issue of what we do to seize the opportunity when people are in prison on a short-term basis and perhaps have uh, markers against them, not not necessarily that they're in prison for domestic violence, but that 
there may be uh, an issue and it's an opportunity to do something which the prison governor is very keen on. So out of that conversation at the Public Services Board in Swansea, uh, I took it up with uh, the Ministry of Justice and uh, the Probation Service in Wales. Uh, and uh, we're in process of trying to design something uh, which will provide um, not necessarily with the high end perpetrators, which is what drive is targeted at, uh, but perhaps people at the lower end so uh, uh, that we can do something while they're in prison, but also that there's continuity when they come out. So uh, we're, we're in, in the process of designing something uh, along uh, those lines. But I, I hope that illustrates very much that it is, yeah. uh, yes, absolutely a partnership with the uh, with yeah. local local authority uh, and others. I was smiling. I was sm sorry, Commissioner. I was smiling then because as you were talking about working with, I was thinking early intervention. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which is which is clearly a buzzword and, and and a good one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ab absolutely, it is, and you know, a public health approach is right at the heart of everything we do. Chair, would you like to, um, Lee perhaps just to come in uh, on the recent aspects of demand, where I think he's got a little more information. Happy with that, Commissioner. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair and, and Commissioner. It was just a quick one while you were talking. Sorry, uh, Lee Jones, Chief Executive of Peace and Crime Commissioner. Um, I did check because uh, the Commissioner is quite right. The figures do sort of fall off in the, in the graph, but that, that was, the, um, I suppose, reflective of this is quite a fluid position. Um, and actually, it's also very difficult to make a comparison between this year and last year. As we're, as we're all aware, we're in unprecedented uh, uh, position at the moment. But just to give you a, a flavour of why there's been, there has been a shift in demand, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. So uh, from the report to about last week, we know that demand is, is slightly higher than this time last year, but it's not easy to make a, a comparison across the board. So for obvious reasons, with, uh, with, with re restrictions lifting, you, you have issues around the, the, the nighttime economy as it has been an antisocial behaviour. I won't repeat all of the things we've discussed, but there are other things such as burglary, business burglary, sorry, which is actually down about 25% compared to last year, and, 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 and things like uh, shoplifting, probably for very obvious reasons because of the, of the restrictions. But, but there is actually, though, um, it's a slight increase, but there is an increase on on. on on general demand uh, on, on, on policing, as, as mentioned. So, um, but I will take the, the points back that you've raised today to get a fuller picture for the next meeting. But as the commissioner's already here, it, it, it is very variant. And as we know, the, the reg regulations are changing again. There may well be implications for further enforcement, um, maybe either uh, directly from police or in support of our local authority partners in particular. Um, but the report there does sort of highlight uh, the overview building on uh, chair the report that we brought to the last panel so we've tried to address the same questions and build on the questions that you you requested last time so just a very brief update but I hope that helps. Thank you for that are you satisfied Councillor Richards? Yep. Yes thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Councillor Evans please. I think you're on mute, Councillor Evans. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Councillor Evans, Swansea, just a quick question regarding the wearing of face masks in stores. Am I right in assuming that the responsibility for enforcement will fall on, on the police or the, amongst a, an enormous amount of other stuff involved in COVID? So, because I've read recently in the papers, for instance, these stores have said categorically that they are not going to be enforcing it because they haven't got the resources to do it. But am I right in saying, ultimately, it's down to the police to enforce this law? Um, no, I mean, we, we've had quite a bit of discussion with Welsh Government because uh, there are things that it's helpful to say in the public domain and things that it's unhelpful. Um, what we don't want to say is that we're not going to bother enforcing. On the other hand, if you take, for instance, the uh, this issue of face masks on buses, um, uh, firstly, uh, the uh, it's very difficult for a driver to 
en force, um, it has to be a question of everybody understanding uh, what their responsibilities are and getting on with it. Um, I'll give you the example of, this, of the ban on smoking in public places. When that came in, it, it, it was obeyed almost instantly. And that wasn't because there was a police officer standing outside each pub waiting to rush in any time uh, anybody flouted the law. It was because everybody recognised the laws change. This is what is expected. This is the way we behave. And the majority of people in a law abiding society do that. And I think in our discussions with Welsh Government, we've been very keen indeed that we put the emphasis on individual and collective responsibility to do the right thing and for the regulations to guide people in doing the right thing. And as I say, that's why I'm pleased that the expectation has been simplified. Um, and I don't think it's a matter of enforcement. You know, immediately people, uh, we could see um, the, the, the actual requirement came in on Monday, but I, going around town, I noticed on Saturday that people were starting to wear face masks as they went into the shop. I was doing it anyway, uh, because I've, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, but it was very clear. You could see the shift in behaviour and people started to think about it. So I think it's really about reinforcing norms with enforcement as a last resort, especially knowing that there are some people who, for health reasons, can't do it. And also there are some people who don't who never behave properly. Uh, and probably we're not, not going to reach them. But if the vast majority of people uh, say, this is the way to behave, I'm going to behave in this way and we behave responsibly, that in itself will make the difference that's needed by our uh, colleagues in the uh, in the health service. So uh, I think that's why if you, uh, if you notice the way that Welsh Government made their announcement, it talked very much uh, about the requirements, for instance, in licensed premises, uh, being enforced by local authority licensing officers with the support of the police rather than the other way around, which there was a bit of a danger of doing. And I think, uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Welsh Government for the way that they've talked these sorts of things through with us uh, and the very, very clear way in which the First Minister has put down uh, the messages on each occasion, which I have to say is rather at odds with the way that messages from central government have come out. And I know uh, that uh, colleagues in England are quite jealous of the fact that in in Wales, the, the quality of messaging actually has helped rather than hindered. Thank you. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Um, Councillor Thomas, please. Good morning. Uh, good, good morning, Chair. Um, I'm going to perhaps come at it from a slightly different angle, although some of the answers will have come out within the uh, Commissioner's um, replies to one or two uh, previous uh, previous questions. Uh, while I fully understand the need for persuasion um, and the compliance of the, of the majority, um, the bottom line at the end will come from enforcement and within my questions is possibly the capacity uh, to enforce given the volume of the of the problem will be the theme uh, within it um, also what i appreciate that the welsh government have been far in advance of central government uh, in terms of rules and um, being uh, cautious. Uh, I was wondering what the police view, and plus it's difficult for you to give after the event or whether they were consulted uh, before, on the permitting, given the increase of COVID resurgence, uh, permitting the gatherings of 30 people outdoors, um, whereas we have restricted uh, indoor, uh, we're still allowing that um, outdoors. Is that productive in in your view in combating uh, the resurgence? Um, and as I outlined at the start, are there sufficient resources in place to monitor breaches of social distancing within these groups? Um, you know, given this also, as you mentioned, a recommendation within RC2 to, to wear masks um, out outdoors. Uh, 
but similarly, um, the other rule of isolation on return from holiday uh, abroad. Um, this may be in place with an individual, but how do we know there is compliance? Uh, what is the proportion of incidents that arise from reported complaints as opposed to general uh, police control? Now, the, the latter two, uh, where you act on complaints or is picked up generally on, on patrol, I would assume are a very small proportion of actual breaches that go under the under the wire. And of course, COVID doesn't acknowledge whether it's reported or picked up on patrol. It passes on uh, anyway. Perhaps if we could address uh, uh, the points around that concept. Thanks very much indeed. I, I think um, I, I'm uneasy about the suggestion that the bottom line is enforcement. Uh, mm. I certainly think that when enforcement is necessary, it has to be done without fear or favour uh, and that we shouldn't hesitate to enforce when it's appropriate. Uh, but I think in the discussion with the public, uh, the whole emphasis has to be that this is only going to work uh, if there is responsibility uh, generally in the community and it comes down to individual and collective uh, responsibility. If I can illustrate that in one way, there was the question, what's going to be the enforcement in relation to buses? And there was one letter in the Western Mail uh, where one innocent member of the public suggested that there wouldn't be a problem if we put a police officer on every bus. Well, can you imagine the resource implications of that, as well as it then makes enforcement the front end rather than saying behave sensibly. Um, and and it, it, it also has a danger of affecting the relationship between the police and the public. In general, the police are support, the public are supporting the law. They're supporting the uh, restrictions that have been brought in. And it's the exceptional uh, that aren't those who are wind up by some of these crazy uh, uh, stuff online. You know, there, there are things on social media that are um, what I describe as almost Trumpian uh, in uh, being in denial of there being a problem with COVID-19. Uh, you know, well, th 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 that's madness. Uh, but it's it's out there and some people read that stuff and believe it. So, yes, there are issues. I think uh, clearly if somebody is flouting the law, refusing to bend, refusing, you know, perhaps being aggressive in the way uh, that they uh, demand to be allowed to do what they want, uh, then uh, the 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 issue of bringing in the police and enforcement would uh, would would apply. But 99 times out of 100, the rule of law demands uh, that people uh, respect the law. Uh, and that's why the balance between the clarity of the rules that are set down and the reasoning behind them being explained properly has been so crucial. And that's, a, where, as I say, where I think the, uh, the situation in Wales has been much uh, better than uh, in England. As far as the gatherings of 30 are concerned, that was a matter of discussion last week when we talked with Welsh Government about what should happen. I mean, there's, you know, there, there, are, there, there are complications in the rules. We had the agreement that uh, four families could form uh, an, an outdoor bubble uh, together. Uh, so then you have the rule of six coming in. How do those relate to each other? Now, the, the only sensible answer is apply common sense uh, to them. It would have, uh, in my view, been quite damaging if you'd moved back on the four families thing, because those who are acting responsibly have gone to great lengths very often to work out how many people can be brought together uh, within a, a, an extended family. It may be for, uh, you know, the uh, 90th birthday of, uh, of granddad or, uh, or, or whatever have you. So, um, if, if people can see that common sense is being applied um, and that they're being invited to apply common sense as well, I think by and large we'll get through this uh, in good measure. And that is, I think, the approach that operational policing and the chief constable uh, have encouraged their officers to apply. It's the way in which things have been phrased by uh, the first minister and the health minister when they've talked about regulation. Uh, and that's why I, I, I don't... Um, I, I'm not afraid of the the element of enforcement, but 
on interviews I've done, for instance, with radio, I found they want to talk only about enforcement, whereas I want to talk about behaviour first with uh, with enforcement uh, in, um, in in reserve. Um, if that's if in reserve means the bottom line, then I'm agreeing with you. Uh, but I think if we could start with talking about enforcement, we're in the wrong place. Then it's the police as a sort of occupying force uh, to, uh, as, as what the law depends on, whereas the law depends on respect for the law uh, by individuals and uh, collective respect for the law uh, within our communities. And I accept entirely that that's most difficult with young people uh, who very often don't listen uh, to the mainstream media, uh, don't read the, uh, the newspapers, and are more likely to be influ influenced by some of the craziness on social media. And of course, that's what led uh, to the uh, events in Banwen uh, and a lot of more local um, gatherings, uh, local raids, uh, where actually the police have been quite successful in intervening early and uh, turning some of those things off. Uh, it was a conversation with uh, uh, what the organisers in one attempted uh, event in uh, the Ely area of Cardiff, for instance, where the conversation between the officers was, do you want to take your very expensive equipment home at the end of the evening or do you want us to take it? Uh, which uh, led to the event being a very short one. Uh, so that's, that, that, and there are other examples, obviously, that we could, could be replica replicated across the place. As far as complaints, um, I, I think it's probably a little early to say as we emerge from lockdown what the trends are, but uh, again, uh, I don't know, Lee, whether um, you've got any uh, immediate evidence uh, and otherwise we can come back with a, with a report in due course. Lee? Thank you, Commissioner. In, ter in terms of complaints, um, no, I haven't got uh, a specific... Um, uh, um, <clears throat> we haven't got specific uh, de details because I think it's too soon for them to have come through the process at the moment, but it is something um, we do monitor and we do dip sample the complaints. And obviously, with the change in regulations um, that came in um, at the start of the financial year, um, a certain level of the, of, of the, the reviews now, the review of complaints come via um, the commissioner's office and by myself and, and my team to review. At the moment, through those, I'm not seeing COVID related enforcement or COVID related complaints in terms of the manner in which policing has been handling it. There's still the, I suppose, the, the usual sort of uh, style of complaints. That, that said, um, it may be that, there's, that it's too early for them to come through the system. So as, as the Commission has offered, offered, we can certainly take that back and look at that to see if there's any trends that uh, we, we can identify that are emerging from, from, this, uh, from this period. But at the moment there isn't, but that's not to say that it's just too early to tell. Thanks Lee. Is that yes. okay, Councillor? Uh, just the one point. Um, and that is how um, we, we issue the need to um, isolate on returning from abroad. Um, but uh, how do we ensure compliance with that? Um, the person who come from abroad be told they have to isolate and then don't. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's a very difficult one because, of course, it's uh, another of those items where there have been differences between what's been said by central government and what's said within Wales. And then, of course, there are some people who are coming into Manchester but returning to Wales or coming into Cardiff Wales Airport, airport and uh, uh, returning to uh, locations in England. Um, I think, in fairness, I'm very sympathetic to Welsh Government in trying to apply common sense here because I know uh, that uh, as uh, there's been an approach to the 21 day, day review uh, of regulations, there have been attempts to make uh, to have discussions between Welsh Government, Scottish Government uh, and uh, Number 10. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, very often been difficult to get the engagement from Number 10 at sufficient time to try to make sure that everything uh, is uh, on the same page across the uh, four nations. Um, I mean, that happened last week with the, uh, the Rule of Six, which was a bit of a challenging one, and we had uh, considerable discussions about it. Um, I think in both Scotland and Wales, the, the, the simple Rule of Six has had more sort of logical development uh, and fitting in with other regulations under that message um, than is the case in, in, in England again. And we do get the level of engagement uh, 
with, uh, uh, with, with Welsh Government at a ministerial and an official level, which helps us at least to alert them to what might be problems. Uh, and there was another good uh, example last week with considerable discussion in the early part of the week. And obviously, uh, with the increase in COVID levels, was likely to be uh, a significant announcement on Friday, as indeed it was. Uh, but I can't fault the level uh, to which the commissioners and chief constables uh, had the opportunity to talk those things through with Welsh Government. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I have two indications to ask questions now, so I'll call uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Richards. Do you want to ask a question? Second question. Um, I'm not calling you in. I'm no, just asking if you're indicating. Yes, you are. No, I'm not indicating. Oh, I have a hand up next to your name. <laughs> All right. I, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Councillor Reese. But I am the chair. Yeah. Okay. It's not a question, it's a comment, really. Can I compliment the police and the uh, government, the Welsh government, on their approach to enforcement? I think it's common sense and I think the public really appreciate it. That's the comments I've been having from my, uh, my, my community. They understand it and I think the majority of people fully will con conform with it. Obviously, you're going to get the odd ones, but I want to compliment you and the police and the government on their approach. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, can I thank you for that comment? Uh, I, I would uh, endorse that uh, and also say it applies, applies to the, uh, the staff of local councils um, who obviously have been doing a difficult uh, job. And, uh, um, you know, on Saturday, for instance, I was on with a, a local authority enforcement uh, officer and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the very fact that we were clearly giving the same messages uh, is, 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 uh, is enormously uh, helpful and and positive. So, uh, thank you for that uh, for those comments. And I, I I will certainly pass that back to the uh, to the chief constable as well. And when the opportunity arises, to our uh, our colleagues in Welsh government. Thank you. Please do. Thank you. Yeah, I think we all identify with those comments. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Rees. Uh, just a quick question from me, if I may. Uh, um, sorry. Mr. Uh, I, um, Mel is waving. I'm not sure if he's drowning or uh, whether that's a, a, a wish for a question, Chair. Yeah, I would like to raise a point, Chair, but I won't interrupt you if you want to talk, say something. No, carry on. Please, please raise your point. Th thank you, Commissioner. And I totally support everything that's been said about our frontline staff and the officers, uh, everyone involved and the partners involved. Fantastic performance over the last six, seven months or so. Uh, can I take it to your report? And it's page 14 of the report uh, where you highlight, and quite rightly so, two very, very important issues. I know very important issues for you, for us, and indeed for the committee on all of South Wales Police and its partners. Those two issues on domestic abuse and uh, then child protection. Um, in relation to domestic abuse, I mean, uh, as you can see, the concern is there, and it's, it's not very often that I, I, I see those words, there is serious concern that a number of crimes have gone unreported due to the nature of the fact that victims and aggressors are confined in the same location. And, and we all guess that that would be the case. And then we go on to say, but the bank holiday, and then the last final line there is, recorded levels did pick up through May and June. And what I would like is, first of all, two issues. Number one, how's it been since Ju June, July, and where, where, where are we now? That's a quarter of a year. So are we still seeing that trend, or that was that just a spike? And uh, what are we going to try to do to improve that position? Bear in mind, we could very well be going into a, a second lockdown. So I just let you know if there's an action plan. Uh, not at this moment. And then the issue of child protection. Well, I, I'm delighted that Operation Break, which, which I'm acutely aware of, is going to be promulgated throughout the force. Uh, I'm really delighted that the Mosovo teams and the CSE teams are going to be involved. So I, I would ask... In, in the future, possibly at a meeting in the new year, when you've got some facts and figures to say how successful, hopefully it's been success, uh, is that we get an update on those. And, and indeed, that'll include the domestic violence, domestic abuse issue as well. And can I, do, I don't know if colleagues are aware, but Mosovo means management of sex offenders and vulnerable others. So I, I just want to, just in case newer members didn't know what that meant. Sorry, stealing your thunder there, Commissioner. 
just to show I, I still know what's going on a little bit. Given my passion for avoiding initials, I'm grateful to you for uh, uh, for, for, for doing that. Um, I, I, d I think on the uh, uh, both the domestic abuse and child protection, I made the point that we went looking for uh, reports uh, precisely because right from the beginning, uh, and this was absolutely person personal for uh, Matt Jukes and myself, uh, I think virtually our first discussion as it became clear we're going to have a lockdown was uh, there are going to be hidden harms here that we need to do as much as we can about. So with uh, uh, with our use of social media, with the use of social media by a variety of voluntary organisations, we've done all we could to reach as many uh, people as possible. So effectively, we went looking for reports and encouraging uh, people to report on those two very serious issues. I think uh, if there is a second lockdown, uh, then we would be looking to uh, um, even more vigorously apply the lessons that we've learned during the uh, the main lockdown uh, so far. Uh, I think it's probably too early to look for figures uh, uh, as we uh, run through the summer and into the autumn. Uh, so I welcome your request really for uh, an update in due course. What I would say is that when we come to December, of course, we will be uh, then reporting on the first three months of the uh, new BCUs and the uh, new operational um, requirements uh, uh, that have been put in place. So we'll be reporting on the new geography, how that's worked, as well as on the levels of reporting and response. Um, so uh, I'll ask Lee to uh, take a task uh, from this uh, for us, uh, 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 with the chair's permission, uh, to put an item on the uh, uh, agenda of the December meeting uh, to provide figures on that and an outline of how the new arrangements are working. Is that OK? Yeah, thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you for that. OK, um, nobody else is indicating that they have a question or a comment. On that basis, I've just got a, a, a quick comment myself, if I may. I'm not sure if you're aware, Commissioner, but the um, WLGA uh, has had some discussions with the Welsh Government regarding possible restrictions to the opening hours of pubs. And they are suggesting that uh, pubs should close at 11pm in an attempt to contain the spread of the virus. Uh, and they're suggesting this could be done on an all Wales uh, regional or individual county basis with a review of the effectiveness of the policy within a three to four week cycle. I'm just wondering, Commissioner, whether your office has uh, a position on this or have they considered it? Um, no, it's not an issue that we've uh, considered to date. Obviously, the uh, arrangements in pubs and uh, times and closure uh, have been a, a matter of discussion locally between uh, local policing teams and uh, uh, the licensing authorities within uh, local authorities. Uh, and if there is uh, uh, a serious uh, um, uh, development of an idea along those lines, I'm sure it'll be something that we would uh, consider um, across policing. And one of the things we'd be looking as to whether um, it's uh, best to have a, a blanket arrangement or to have arrangements that are left to the discretion of uh, um, each local authority in consultation with the police in that uh, uh, local area. Um, uh, there's no easy answer to that because uh, the first is a very simple message. The second allows you to nuance the arrangements uh, in accordance with uh, um, the the, di the different circumstances in different local authority areas. Uh, you know, just to mention one thing, it's different different in a big rural area than it is to uh, our two big cities of, of Cardiff and, and Swansea, uh, where the um, uh, the vigorous nature of the nighttime economy um, uh, brings a, a, a set of uh, a set of problems which are different to to many other areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, I note the the comment you make, and uh, uh, we'll cer certainly bear it in mind. Yeah, thanks for that. I think I think from a personal perspective, I think it would be far better to go to a regional situation rather than leave it to each individual authority. Uh, but I take on board the comments that you make of the disparities, if you like, between local um, 
uh, uh, rural economies and and more uh, virile, should we say, city economies. Okay, thank you for that, Commissioner. Uh, can I have a mover, please, that uh, we uh, note the report? I move, Chair. So much, thank, yeah. thank you for that, Councillor Rees. On that basis, can we move on then to the uh, finance report, please, Commissioner? Um, very briefly, the financial situation is immensely challenging. Um, I don't need to tell anybody in local government uh, how big the challenges are. Um, the challenges are big for Welsh government, they're big for local government, they're big for the health service and they're big for policing. Peter will outline uh, uh, the challenges we face now, but uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the whole of the public sector uh, faces a, a, a massive element of uncertainty, which is made even worse uh, when you reflect that we are uncertain as to what the next um, stage of the pandemic is going to look like. So, Peter. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, in the interest of time, and picking up on the comment you made at the beginning about using this time um, usefully, You'll see that, that you have both a report and a presentation. The report is in three parts. Um, you've asked previously for an in-year report uh, on, the, um, on the accounts of, of the police and the commissioner, and you have that in part B. But given where we are um, with things generally, I also, I also thought it would be useful to include just a small section on our year-end position, which is, is not yet complete, but is about to be. But probably more importantly, and as the Commission has alluded to, we, we have some significant issues facing us. Now, they're articulated in Section C, but they're also in the presentation. So um, with your permission, I think it's Part C and the presentation that I think we should probably spend most time on. It's extremely timely because, as, as you're aware, the Comprehensive Spending Review it, it is about to be launched. And those issues that you see in Part C and the presentation have all been articulated, quantified and communicated to the Home Office. I mean, as we speak now, the Home Office are writing the bid to the Treasury, which will go in later th this month. And then we're due to find out in November the outcome of the spending review, which, of course, will determine the basis of our funding for the next three years. So with that in mind, I would like us, if, um, if you will, to focus on that presentation. But if I start with just making a couple of brief comments on part A and part B of the paper that was set, uh, sent in advance. Um, part A is the year end. For, for obvious reasons, that process has been delayed this year. Firstly, because the, um, the finance staff of the police in the early months of the pandemic were, were, were tied up with processing overtime claims. Uh, the force agreed on behalf of the other 43 to, to purchase PPE equipment because there was a, a real, real problem early on in terms of getting the equipment across the 43 forces. So for good reason, we delayed the production of the accounts. And most latterly, Audit Wales are, are finding the, the audit process very difficult as well in terms of their remote working. So for that reason, we anticipate the accounts will be finalised by the 28th of this month. There will be an audit committee on that day, uh, which will hopefully endorse the accounts for signature by the commissioner and the chief constable. Just one or two issues on those on the accounts process. It, the audit is going well. Two issues that did come up. Firstly, were disclosure issues relating to the McLeod pension issue that I'm sure some colleagues are aware. It's to do with a, an age discrimination case that was uh, raised. That only has issues on, on the disclosure uh, of the pension note, but we're, we're, we were very keen to have the latest valuation provided by the government actuary on that. Uh, otherwise, we may have had what's called an emphasis of matter in our audit report, which we didn't want. So with the, uh, the cooperation of, of Umar and his team, we've got the very latest valuation in our accounts, which will obviate the need for an emphasis of matter. The other issue that's come up, and again, you'll probably be aware from your own um, colleagues, is the valuation of buildings post-COVID, in particular retail uh, and those sorts of buildings that have seen a, a big drop in valuation. 
So we had a good discussion with our valuer who was content given the um, given our estate, which of course predominantly is police buildings, that there would no there be no diminution in the value of our buildings. And tangentially, again, you're probably aware a number of councils have invested in retail and airports and so on that have seen a plummet in value and a plummet in rental income. Um, I mean, to give you assurance, that's not something that 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 has affected us at all. So with that in mind, we're expecting a clean audit report. We're not expecting any emphasis of matter in that. And like I said, that and it will be completed in time. Uh, November is, is, is the actual deadline date for the accounts to be signed. So we're well within that period. So that's the accounts. In terms of the in-year um, management accounts, I, I'm pleased to, to, to report quarter one, which takes us to June. By way of background, you'll recall from the police and crime panel back in January, this is a, a complex year financially. Um, we had the announcement very, very late because of the election, as, as you'll recall. Secondly, the headline increase of 7.5% was, was due entirely to the uh, police uplift program to which the government remains extremely committed to putting the uh, the, the 20,000 extra officers in by March 23. However, that um, that grant didn't include uh, any provision for inflation for the existing staff. So, so that made it very, very challenging, if you recall. And we had to take a decision about some of the uplift funding. You know, how much would we dedicate towards future infrastructure costs for the new officers and how much to put in, in the revenue account. And that was a that was a decision we made, you know, taking all factors into account. The year has become even more complex uh, with COVID, where we are incurring additional costs. And I have been able to get the absolute up to date figure of what South Wales Police has spent up to the end of August. And that figure is two point one nine four million pounds. Uh, and to put that into context, the whole of Wales is 4.9 million if one adds in the three forces. So our figure is 2.194. Now, some of that remains at risk. The Home Office hasn't confirmed that all of that will be reimbursed. They have confirmed that the medical grade PPE will be reimbursed by the Department of Health. And that's around about 250,000. So at the moment, quite a bit of that 2.1 million is at risk. Um, the government is allowing us to use some of the money that they've ring fenced for the extra officers to be used to, to, to cover those costs. However, because our, um, our uplift programme is going very, very well, and we anticipate we'll recruit up to the maximum uh, 136 and indeed beyond because the next tranche is coming soon. Um, if we don't get full reimbursement by the year end, then, then that could be an issue for us. Um, turning to the management accounts, you'll see uh, quarter one is quite early on in the year. There is a recorded um, surplus of six million, which is healthy, in particular if we don't get all of those COVID costs reimbursed. But it's uh, a lot of that is to do to timing issues. And I think the two uh, critical points I've mentioned: recruitment. Um, the Home Office are are asking for monthly returns on our recruitment levels that they want that 136 on an additionality basis. So they're very much looking at our other levers and starters to make sure that the, those funded numbers are indeed over and above our recruitment levels. So that's a, that's a big, big job for the force at the moment uh, to ensure that those recruitment levels are done appropriately. And we're about to hear from the government how the next 8,000 new officers will be split amongst the forces. The first 6,000 were split on a formula funding basis. So South Wales Police received 2.2% of the 6,000. Uh, we await to hear how that allocation basis will be made for the next 8,000, but we expect it'll be done similarly on a um, formula basis. If that was the case, that would mean an extra 400 officers for South Wales Police by the end of the uh, 20,000 uh, recruitment drive. So that, that's that's it. You, you'll see a word on capital. There is some slippage um, compared to the original budget. That's largely due to the Police Learning Centre, which is those of you who've been past headquarters recently will have seen that that building is, is coming up at a great speed of knots. Uh, that's now due to be completed by March 2022, which, um, which is slightly uh, later than anticipated. 
So you'll see from the capital report that, that there's a 15 mid million slippage compared to when we put the forecasts together. Um, what I suggest I do now, Chair, is stop there, uh, having covered part A and part B of the reports. Happy to take um, questions. And then I suggest we work through the presentation of, of the significant issues we face. Um, and we do that by following the presentation, if, if, if that's acceptable to you. Yes, thank, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, can I just ask members if they have any questions for Peter before we move on to section C? I've got nobody indicating at the moment. Nobody with their hand up? Okay, thank you for that. I, I think if I can just um, jump in on one thing. Um, Peter mentioned that uh, if we get the uh, figures of additional officers um, in terms of the uh, proportionality uh, across forces, it would be roughly the additional 400 officers. Of course, that depends where the central government decides uh, to change the balance uh, and perhaps give more officers to central functions like the National Crime Agency. Um, so there's there's a degree of uncertainty there. And the other thing is, I think the most important uh, point that comes out of Peter's report, and it'll come out um, of of the uh, the presentation as well, is that it's it's lovely that the uh, government is a, it's a very positive that they're giving twenty thousand additional police officers, but that will still bring us back to slightly lower than the level of uh, police officers we had at twenty ten. Uh, so it doesn't take it doesn't restore the cuts that have taken place over the last 10 years uh, and by giving the money for the addition but not the money for the uh, uh, for the existing uh, 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 officers and staff that we employ uh, it puts a real squeeze on resources and uh, along with all the other challenges it is particularly worrying I think. Yes th thank you Commissioner I think that's a point well made. Uh, well I still don't have anybody indicating they want to speak. So, Peter, would you like to continue with the presentation on Section C? I, I think Peter and I have, uh, have discussed that as far as possible, uh, he'll hit us with the headlines rather than going into the detail. But obviously, uh, all the detail uh, is available there if uh, uh, if required and if there are questions, Chair. Yeah, of course. And I think if anybody needs any further detail, they will be asking but as you say it is available thank you commissioner over to peter okay thanks chair do you all have access to the presentation i'm i'm trying to share it but i don't know um i'm new it's, to this teams it showed up then and it's disappeared now all right okay can you see it now yeah I've got, i've got it peter now yeah yeah okay. Can, can, can I suggest, Chair, if there are any questions, please shout out, because um, as the Commissioner has mentioned, some of these issues will be common to um, uh, panel colleagues. Mm. Um, but I'll, can, I'll, I'll, can, I'll, can I'll, I just I'll, say that if anybody's got any questions about it, don't shout out, just raise your hand in the box. <laughs> That's the new way of putting it. OK, on to the issues. The first thing which I, I, I've touched on and which the Commissioner has just said is um, it's crucial for us that the baseline grant is protected. What does that mean? It really means that over the next three years that we get sufficient funding to cover our um, our inflation, our staff uh, incremental costs and other cost pressures. Uh, and you'll probably recall from um, the, the, the the precept report from earlier in the year, um, for this year, that figure is about 12 million for South Wales Police. Now, that wasn't funded at all, uh, and it, it puts an inordinate amount of pressure on, on the precept. So we kind of made it um, fairly clear and, uh, and, and open to the, uh, the Home Office what those costs will be. So they've been modelled, um, existing staff, and of course, some of the uplift numbers will start to get pay increases themselves three years down the line. So, so that's pretty critical for us. Um, and also a sort of tangential point is making sure that baseline is right, because the current year needs a bit of unpicking, you know, given the fact that we've got um, a ring fence grant for salaries for uplift. We've got a non ring fence grant for the uh, ancillary costs. We're incurring two million, as I just said, for COVID, probably another two million, some of which is being uh, reimbursed, some of which is not. So um, what we don't want to do is get, the, is get the baseline off to the wrong start, so to speak. 
So, so that remains a bit of a risk for us, actually, that, that we get the right baseline going forward. But most importantly, that we get uh, protection through, through, through grant increases throughout the period. If I move on to the, um, the next slide, this is something that you, you will be aware of. Um, COVID clearly is having an implication on council tax receipts. Um, the collection rates are, uh, are being assessed um, uh, consistently. Now, this will have an implication on policing from a number of issues. One, uh, there may not be the, uh, the increase in the tax base that, that, that we forecast each year. Uh, and if the collection rates drop, then that has an implication on onto us as well. So we are keeping in touch closely with the WLGA, uh, who you're probably aware have produced a report on this, and their uh, th their current figures are that the collection rates have dropped between 0.7 and 2.6 across across Wales. Um, so we, we've done a bit of modelling, and if you can see from the slide, that that could be um, 6.9 million to 14.7 uh, risk for us. Uh, in terms of the the three areas that that are relevant in this area, so we will also be maintaining close contact with Welsh government about this as well. Uh, just not to be disadvantaged compared to the English forces, where there's a, a slightly um, different uh, policy and, and rule in place. So so that's one that we, we very much need to keep abreast with over the next uh, couple of weeks and months. The next item, which I think we've said before, the apprenticeship levy, where there exists, um, still exists uh, a slight inequality between Wales and England. Uh, we all pay the same levy, essentially, but we don't get access to the apprenticeships. So for this current year, you know, across Wales, there's, about, there's a four million shortfall, and that's with the receipt of a million pound home office uh, money and i know the commissioner has has um, spent a lot of time with the home office making this point um because of course if when numbers go up with more officers coming on stream that deficit will increase as we pay more levy and we pay more training costs so it is something that we believe needs to be uh, addressed as part of the comprehensive spending review and we provided what the, the that forecast increase to 6 million uh, is a figure that we provided to the Home Office um, for their um, consideration and hopefully um, inclusion in their submission to the Treasury. The next item is another one I think that we've, you're probably aware of, funding for, for Cardiff as a capital city, where unlike Edinburgh and London, we don't get a specific allowance from the, the, the Home Office. Edinburgh is, is, is um, slightly different from London because they, they've got you know, Police Scotland there now as, as, as one authority. But I've done a fair bit of work, you know, as to what happened before Police Scotland was formed. And there was indeed funding provided for um, policing Edinburgh as a capital city. So um, it would appear that Cardiff remains um, on its own, as it were, in terms of, of not receiving that. We are putting together a comprehensive document that articulates what the additional costs are uh, you know, you're probably aware, you know, we have the Welsh government, we have an awful lot of events and, and dignitaries. So we estimate that that cost is four million a year. Uh, now, whether that gets reflected in the spending review or the funding formula, which I'll come on to in a minute, uh, is is not decided yet. Um, but we're happy to send, when that document is, is produced, we're happy to, to, to send it to panel members, because I think it makes very interesting reading. Um, the pensions grant, uh, I think this has been raised before. We're still in a very uncertain situation about getting the pensions deficit fully funded. Uh, for the last two years, the Treasury has made available a grant which has not been promised to be baselined into future grants. So until that happens, uh, we've got a 3.2 million risk, if you like, but that grant, should it not be continued, would, would have to be funded by some other way. And you know, we, we strongly believe this could be because this is a central pension scheme. It would be wholly inappropriate to ask local taxpayers to pay for uh, a government pension scheme. So, again, we, we made strong um, representations to the Home Office, as indeed of all the um, forces across uh, across England and Wales, that that grant be properly baselined into uh, future grant settlements. Preserving existing programmes is the next. Um, 
you may be aware of the former Police Transformation Fund, which was a strategic fund that, that actually financed uh, multi-year capital and preventative programmes. Um, with the uh, uplift money last year, the, the government signals its intention to end the transformation fund. Um, but there are a number of multi-year projects that are still ongoing, uh, the biggest of which is the emergency services network, which is the, the notion of putting all the blue light services on one uh, network, which makes eminent sense. That's not due to, to be completed until 2024. Uh, and as you can imagine, is an extremely expensive project. So uh, having confirmation of seeing those projects through to their fruition is really, really important, as are our prevention programmes. We've mentioned DRIVE earlier. There are a whole host of other programmes that, that may have their funding ceased um, because the funding is likely to be put into um, uh, other government priorities. But that would be a risk for us, not so much now, but further down the line when the benefit of these prevention programmes is not manifested itself in terms of lower policing costs. Um, I think I'm coming to the end now. Uh, the, the, the other strategic issue that we're slightly concerned about is um, if, the, if the Home Office is successful in achieving uh, a positive settlement from the Treasury, and we know that uplift is, is going to cost a lot, and we know the government is committed to crime reduction, so the headline figure coming out of that might, may well be positive. Uh, and we are expecting that the, that the government may um, impose, I'm calling efficiency savings, they could be cuts um, as well. And I think the key point for us is if that has to happen, it has to happen. But, but all those factors I, I, I've mentioned over the last five or 10 minutes, in particular, the preservation of the baseline grant it'd be very, very difficult for us to make further savings if we don't get a fully funded baseline. Uh, and that's the key message that we've, um, uh, we've, we've put forward, that there are rumours of policing having to find uh, a billion pound over the three years, of which 30% could be cashable savings, uh, and 100 million a year for us would be something in the order of 2.1 million and as you've been aware from previous uh, reports, it is becoming more and more difficult to eke out efficiency savings when essentially uh, police numbers are now ring fenced. We can't go anywhere near that, which necessarily reduces the scope we have for finding further uh, savings. So, so that remains a key risk. And just for information, over the last 10 years, this this this. Um, this slide illustrates the amount of savings cuts, call it what you will, that we've made over the last 10 years, their cumulative effect, and what each year's cut stroke savings effectively means in, in a cutting grant. And as you can see, cumulatively, we're up to 60 million, hence my point about there, there being a reducing scope for going much further. This is my final point, I believe. Uh, the police funding formula it's not been reviewed for 20 years. It's out of date. It's opaque. It does disadvantage South Wales Police. Two examples, the capital city funding I've mentioned. The other one is the dampening of grant, where essentially uh, South Wales Police redistributes grant income to um, uh, David Powys and North Wales. Uh, we would hope that anomalies like that would get ironed out in the police funding formula. The government has signalled its intention to review it in the in, in the wake of the spending review, uh, and, and we hope you know we await sort of positively that that, that review will happen, which would, um, as I said, benefit uh, us. My final slide it, are issues that you're all aware of, but these aren't specific; these are more general issues. The long-term implications of COVID-19, we don't know. Uh, the outcome of the trade deal with the EU is another big, big uh, unknown and is, is a risk, as is the economic downturn and the national debt. Uh, and a particular concern of mine is, is the rise in interest rates, which, of course, are very, very low. Uh, we've got we are quite highly geared. We have a lot of borrowing. So we're very, very sensitive to interest rate increases on our borrowing from the Public Works Loan Board. So, so, so that remains a, a critical 
risk for us. Um, so that chair is, is a whistle stop to her through um, the strategic issues that we face. I will stop there. Uh, happy to take any questions that members may have. Thank you, Peter, for that. Uh, and, and thank you for being as brief as you possibly could. I've only had one indication that someone wanted to speak. It was from Councillor Richards. Although you're indicating, Councillor Richards, that you were satisfied that an answer was provided during the presentation? Yes, I, yes, thank you. I was going to ask about the calculation of the money for Cardiff as a capital city. Um, and uh, Peter said that he was going to send the further details, so I'm happy with that. Uh, maybe, maybe I could ask because it was on my mind. Um, do we know how much Edinburgh gets as a capital city for their policing from from the centre? Peter, I believe there is a formula that goes with it, isn't there? Is that, yeah, there's. Um, it's it's a bit more complicated than that because of the, as Peter said, the change over to the development of. Uh, um, uh, police Scotland, they nationalised the police force, which I think is a massive mistake, by the way. Um, and uh, that means you can't see in the way that you could previously what's going on under the surface of Scotland. So uh, it's something that Peter and I have been discussing on uh, 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 the need for a, a bit of a, a deeper dive into how it used to be done um, uh, in order to uh, support our uh, case, which, as uh, Peter mentioned, is is being developed uh, for uh, further submission to the Home Office. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I have no other indications. Uh, oh, was that somebody indicating? No? Yes. Mm -hmm. Councillor Rees, please. Do we have any, f uh, about the Northern Ireland Police Force, uh, how are they, how are they uh, uh, funded? Uh, is it different to Wales? Um, it, it is. There's a lot of differences in respect of Northern Ireland for a variety of reasons, which uh, members of the panel will uh, will appreciate. The very different political situation, the uh, uh, massive problems to overcome uh, at the time of the, uh, the um, uh, Downing Street Declaration and subsequent arrangements. Uh, and it, it is quite difficult to draw any comparisons uh, from uh, from Belfast to Cardiff. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I have. Um, OK, thank you. I have no other indications that people want to ask questions or, or to, to comment in any way. So can I have a mover, please, that we note the report? I move, Chair. Are we are we all Senator, agreed? Are yeah. we all agreed? I'll take it. Yes, chair. Yeah, yeah. happy to agree. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, all agreed. Yes, fine. Thank you for that. Music to my ears. What a cacophony of sounds. Thank you so much, everyone. Um moving on then. Can we get rid of Sorry? Yeah. Can we get rid of it now? Can we get rid of the I still got the presentation up. What's 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 occurred in there? Oh, we can be taken. Oh, from, yeah, yeah, that's, from, that's, that's all right. There we are, Councillor Richards. You happy with that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. She, she wants to keep an eye on us, Chair. Absolutely, we all need to keep an eye on, don't we? Yeah, in all fairness. Item seven, everyone. Um, the CCTV presentation. Yes. Uh, um, can I say that I'm um, really grateful to Peter for um, a, a really um, big piece of work. Um, in conjunction with uh, ACC Jenny Gilmer um, on uh, uh, on this, uh, and um, it would be tempting to spend quite a bit of time on it um, uh, and show some respect to the work that Peter's leading. Um, in in view of your injunctions at the beginning, though, uh, I, I'm going to suggest that Peter takes us very very quickly through the uh, presentation and that we go to questions. Uh, and that perhaps we return to the topic in future. Thank you. Shall I kick off? Um, if you don't mind, then I will. I'll share another one with you, if I may. Um, can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, 
I, I will go through this very quickly. First thing I would say is that we've we, we're forming a very collaborative project, and this this will give you an indication of who's involved, which is essentially every local authority, the commissioner, the chief, um, Welsh government, and we've also got a link into the national police uh, chiefs council through um, Jenny Gilmer, as the commissioner has mentioned, who's got a national role, and she's providing a resource from that. Um, national role onto this local project, shall I call it, just so that we pick up best practice from, from around the country. And on that point, th these are the partners who are working at a national level to, um, to develop CCTV. You'll see in the top left, the Surveillance Camera Commissioner. And I think you were all sent a letter from Tony Porter, who essentially endorsed the approach that, that, that we were taking here in, in South Wales to look at a, um, a collaborative approach and, uh, and seek to maximise the benefits from, from working together. So um, we have a, a steering group, which I'll, I'll come on to in a minute, but essentially the vision that we're working towards it is exactly that, is to create and nurture a partnership that maximises the effectiveness and efficiency of our, of our capability across the communities. Um, and specifically, we want to future proof the the technology which is at different stages at the moment across all seven we want to create data information that demonstrates value for money uh, um, i will put my hand up here i don't think us as policing generally have have successfully communicated that to local uh, authority um, partners so we don't have the convincing data information uh, at the moment and that's something that we want to address um, and then fi finally, how communities are made safer through the use of CCTV technology, uh, and that's policing and uh, local authorities. I think we've got a bit, bit of work to do collectively in order to achieve that. Um, very quickly, this is what the project is looking to do. So the short term is essentially um, to make sure there are no short term vulnerabilities, because I know a number of authorities through financial pressures uh, are considering switching off the service, which um, we're trying to um, address. We're looking to introduce the a, a service level agreement, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, um, to create a, a governance structure for the project to see it through uh, and to do the, the assessments of, of, of both our needs, leading to long term, the, the technology solution, the benefits, the data, uh, the partnership, um, and then I think uh, the, the, the bottom one is quite important to make sure we come up with a sustainable model, which yes, does take into account financing and who's going to pay for it. But more importantly, firstly, to articulate the benefits, uh, the joint benefits that we will all have from um, from creating a sustainable long term solution. Um, so the. Um, Police actually invested in 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 a in in a police officer to undertake some preliminary re uh, research of the current state of play, and, and I put five bullet points, which are some of the highlights of where we are now. And it's very much a mixed picture uh, across all seven local authorities in terms of where they are uh, for capital investment, uh, where they are, as I said, in terms of their. Um, consideration of the future of their CCTV coverage before this project um, kicked off uh, and, and the, the, the relevant costs across all seven differ as well. Um, the police doesn't run any CCTV provision other than the buildings and, and vehicles. Across the seven local authorities, there are six control rooms and in total, the revenue costs are 2.3 million which is an interesting figure to take because certainly it's my objective to try to beat that. If we do, if we do and can come up with a collaborative solution, that's a really good benchmark to try to beat with, of course, improved technology. Um, moving on to going forward, I hope all would agree that um, partnership working is the most viable and sustainable way of, of continuing and improving CCTV service. Now, I would add a caveat there because I'm aware a number of authorities have either um, just invested in CCTV or are about to. And we're not saying in this project that those plans should be stopped or held back. What we are saying is that wherever local authorities are in the process, 
to be part of this joint venture, you know, which is a long term solution would be really, really valuable. Um, and we'll identify the, the funding opportunities, which I'll, I'll come on to in a minute. But this is not about stopping the good work. A lot of good work has gone on. Uh, it's about making sure that we're future proofed, all of us in, in the future. Uh, I mentioned about the costs and I'll come on to the, the, the governance in, in a minute. But that last point, I, I know members will have issues about who's paying for it, who benefits from it um, and so on. So one of the objectives of this group is to come up with a transparent and fair financial model that does look to um, you know, share costs in proportion to the benefits that, that all partners will gain from it. And I will here mention Safer Streets um, and congratulations to Merthyr Council um, who were successful in obtaining half a million from the uh, Home Office. Uh, that's largely uh, to do with acquisitive crime. And of that half a million, 300,000 is for CCTV, uh, which is great. We put in two other bids uh, in the west and the east of the region. We were unsuccessful this time, but we fully intend to put bids in at the next round. And that might be another source of getting uh, additional capital funding for CCTV. So we're constantly looking at innovative ways to raise that capital. And in the next stage will be um, the sustainable revenue model. Just a word of um, how we intend to deliver this through our governance structure. Um, we have now established a, a strategic delivery board uh, and a massive thank you to all local authorities who have kindly uh, put forward um, generally a very senior member of staff, typically deputy chief exec level, to sit on that board. Um, I represent the commissioner ACC Gilmer represents the Chief Constable. Um, the Commissioner and the Chief Constable have, are investing in a full-time project manager uh, and indeed a, a project support officer to see this through. Uh, and we're really pleased that Welsh Government are also on that group, as are, as I mentioned, the national um, setup. We have a representative from somebody who is on that national group. And that's really, really insightful because we, 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 we get details of best practice uh, throughout the country that we can incorporate here. Underneath that delivery board, we're going to set up a, um, a specific delivery board, which will again comprise of local authority control room um, reps and, and other relevant people uh, as and when needed. And that will report up to the main governance group. Finally, now I mentioned before about the service level agreement. Uh, it is something that we would like uh, local authorities to um, sign up to. Uh, and what I've got on this slide here is uh, are some of the areas that that service level agreement will cover. Um, and I think the indications so far are that local authorities are willing to sign up to that. And I think that would be a further endorsement of the uh, willingness to work together to um, a mutually beneficial conclusion. So in summaries, it is early days that the main groups only met once so far. The delivery groups in the process are being set up. Um, but I think with a fair wind, I think we've got a really, really good chance of tackling this issue front on and hopefully delivering those objectives that I outlined earlier, Chair. I think I'll uh, stop there, but happy to take any questions. Um, if I can just say, um, Chair, the, um, this sits in the... Uh, in the context of the wider context of the fact that we have to invest in technology uh, in order to be effective in policing, particularly with all the challenges and the financial constraints. Uh, and that's a very complex landscape nationally as well. South Wales Police have led the way in investing in technology so that our people can be out rather than stuck in police stations uh, in order to enhance their engagement uh, and uh, response capacity in local communities. Data management is very, very complex because of the number of partners with which the police work. Um, and finally, we've looked at innovative ways like uh, facial recognition technology, um, in which we recently had a court decision which um, expressed uh, some concerns about the national level of governance and legislation covering this area, but was actually in the findings very positive about the way that it uh, had been used and deployed in South Wales, uh, as well as the way in which we've uh, insisted on accountability and getting the balance right between protecting 
the public and protecting uh, the human rights and liberties that are so important to all of us. Thank you, Commissioner. I've had three indications uh, of questions or comments. So can I call Councillor Gray in first, please? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for uh, the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, is there an entire focus with this on monitoring, as in live control room monitoring, or is the focus looking at evidence uh, and securing that? Because to talk to different police officers at different time, the, um, the, the usefulness of uh, monitoring versus the ability after a fact to have evidence uh, seems to fall further down as it's more often useful to have had evidence uh, the number of times that a control room picks up an issue and is able to deal with something and clearly that will be different if you're in a metropolis city center uh, or or, or, a, or a rural town say within the vale of glamorgan um or, or barry high street for instance um so i wondered uh, certainly look at the costs that are quoted in the presentation there 2.3 million a year that can't be active monitoring 24-7. I recognise you said some, some authorities are part-time across those six control rooms. Um, and so I'd be really interested in understanding whether more than more than just monitoring is being looked at, because uh, I think underlining the, the knowledge, people know that there's a lot of cameras capturing everything and they shouldn't commit crime because you're more likely to get caught versus those cameras that are swiveling around and trying to see what's going on. Uh, and, I, and I think if looking at technology, perhaps there's a blended approach that will allow monitoring at the same time as as downloading. Clearly, if you put something in a place, it's going to cost someone some time and money to get it out of there. But, you know, an officer investigating a, a robbery in the street at a certain time in a certain area, you know, ideally you want them to be able to go to one system, look it up, pull up the information, it's there and downloaded. I don't necessarily see the need for a control room in that situation. So I, I, it's a rambling point, but it was more about this. Are we looking at a model that is seeking to use a control room as part of a safer environment? Or are we trying to have a, a wider spread of cameras to, to cover evidence? Thank you. Um, if I if I come in first, I, I think it's both, actually. And I think it's, it's for the group to, to decide that we, we, we're not we're not predetermined in terms of control rooms where they should be and so on. I think we'll let the technology work. So I think we've got an open canvas on, on, on that. Um, and I think it's, you know, because this is a partnership with all of us together, I think that that's, that's one issue that the strategic board will, will need to consider, but it, it's a really, really good point. Uh, and it's something that I'll, I'll raise next time we meet. Um, on the cost that was, um, these were costs that were gathered from each local authority. Now, it may be that some costs are fixed and haven't been picked up and some are marginal. I take the point there, but but these costs were gathered from from asking each local authority what they uh, what they currently charge. But it's um it's it's a difficult situation. It's, it's not a straightforward situation because some authorities are receiving the service from other other authorities, as it were. So some don't have direct costs, as it were but are having indirect costs. So it, it does come with a slight health warning, but those are the figures that each of the seven have provided. Commissioner, did you want to add to the, the, the first point about evidence or, or live? No, I, I, just the, the, the fact that I think the exchange of information is really useful on issues like this, because um, some authorities have invested a lot, as you uh, rightly said, Councillor Gray, the, uh, uh, the situation in a big metropolis is different to uh, uh, to a, a more rural area and, uh, uh, you know, Cardiff, by its very, the nature of the capital city has had to push the boundaries in some cases in, in ways that are quite impressive. It's, uh, it's worth a visit to their, um, uh, their, their, their centres and they're combining those two as well to look at uh, how you can do uh, be much more flexible. So uh, I, I, I'm very interested in what comes out of the group, but I I think Peter's approach is right, that we don't go to this with a predetermined solution, but we make sure that all of those issues uh, are raised and discussed with the uh, with the seven local authorities to get the best solution for everybody. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have a number of, of indications now, so can I call Councillor Thomas in first, please? 
Okay, uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, very good point just made uh, of uh, live versus uh, monitoring versus recorded. Um, just used for evidence uh, when an incident occurs. Massive difference between those two concepts in terms of um, the human rights that uh, the Commissioner referred to and his concerns um, earlier. Um, the question um, I'm going to raise is uh, around the use of them. In terms of, uh, it's been raised of uh, unquestioned the cost versus the effectiveness, um, and do the two uh, balance out? Is is the uh, cost worth it in terms of how effective they are? Particularly in terms of, uh, there is a thought that it simply moves the problem uh, to where there are no cameras and no CCTV uh, once. Uh, they are aware or people who wish to um, cause crime um, are aware of the presence of CCT, uh, CCTV cameras. And on the human rights side of it, would we have to achieve, uh, in order to mitigate what I've just described, would we have to achieve virtually an Orwellian uh, Big Brother as in 80, 1984 level to remove that effect? Um, on the, the latter point, is um, we talked about the costs and it would be good to have that enlarged upon, but it won't just be uh, county borough councillors, uh, uh, councillors, for example, um, smaller local community councillors may want to uh, engage uh, with this and how costs are met uh, will be uh, of high importance. Um, can I answer first? Um, uh... Uh, George Orwell gave some uh, very important warnings to society um, and uh, the use of technology is only as good as the quality of supervision and <clears throat> the, 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 the moral and practical imperatives of its use. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a topic on which um, I could go on at some length because we've been into this uh, in in real depth in in South Wales, um, it, because you've got technology and you can use it, it doesn't mean that you should use it. Uh, and it's absolutely crucial that there is a, a a proper balance between the protection of the rights of the individual and of the public generally, uh, and the use of technology um, to protect the public uh, and to catch the uh, uh, the the. Um, uh, the, the 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 offenders. Um, so that is right at the heart of of, of everything that we uh, consider to do and and do. Your final point about how the costs are uh, dealt with and the different uh, players, I think, is absolutely right. Uh, but uh, frankly, I think it's too early to answer that question. Uh, what what I think we need to do, and I'm sure Peter would agree with this, is that we need to make sure that that question is answered when we come back with. Uh, the report of what has been discussed and agreed through this uh, working group. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Okay. Councillor Cowan, did you want to come in at this point? Yes, just briefly, just to say that when the uh, Commissioner does another survey again, engaging with the public, it might be worth um, putting like a major sash, uh, section on this. I think a lot of people would welcome this. We have lots of kind of crime and antisocial behaviour in our communities locally. And I think having additional CCTV would be a, a, a massive benefit. So just one question for you to consider, really. We talked about local authorities and possibly some of them withdrawing. Um, is that all to do with funding or is it concerns about the operations? And also as local councillors, would we be allowed to have the breakdown of the cost implications for each council? Thank you. I think certainly those points will be part of um, the report when they've been worked through. I mean, at an earlier stage, there were uh, a number of councils who were uh, looking at um, uh, with, with some concern uh, because, of course, they're, we've all been in the situation of looking at what we can cut. Uh, I think we're in a more mature area of discussion now of saying, how, how how can we actually look at what's needed, uh, get it proportionate, do it in a partnership way, work it through together? And that's the whole point of the approach that Peter's taking, which is painstaking, does take time, but is a far more 
uh, joined up and responsible way of uh, of dealing with a topic like this. Yes, thank thank you, Commissioner. Um, I thought they were going to bring you up then at one point. Uh, okay, Councillor Rees, please. Can I ask that the uh, is the negotiations with the with the councils taking place under the auspices of the WLGA, or is it with individual councils? This is within the South Wales Police area, um, uh, as distinct from. Uh, you know, an all Wales approach. Um, uh, I think the WLGA is aware of um, the discussions, but um, it's it's led within our police area. And you'll be aware I raised this about the question of costing and about the benefits for our local councils and uh, the greater benefit to the police at a previous meeting. And I still have those reservations. I simply say, how can I? How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Commissioner. Thank you, Councillor uh, Rees. Councillor Evans, please. Yeah, am I unmuted? I think I am. Just a couple of quick points. I mean, modern police in the Commissioner will agree, obviously, is uh, the use of CCTV is invaluable. Any major crime that exists today, such as the Manchester bombings, any any stabbings in the street, the first thing the police are looking at is live evidence, obviously from witnesses who see it, but otherwise CCTV coverage. And the amount of convictions, it'll be interesting to know in South Wales Police how many times they've been successful in producing this evidence at court, which will strengthen our, uh, our efforts to get bids in to cover it. I mean, um, technology is changing rapidly. I think in Bristol, for instance, they've got a, a very good scheme there where the police can download information from a CCTV camera on the street. So if a, an incident happens on the street, they just go to the nearest camera and download it onto their their, their, their equipment which they carry. And, and that obviously speeds things up. So if, if the suspect is in the, in the area, they can make a, a quick arrest, for example. Um, so. As far as sort of good practice is concerned, and building the case up for funding, I mean, we need to know all about this, don't we? So we need to know how active the, the South Wales Police have been in using the CCTV, because it's not only CCTV, but whatever happens today, the police are looking for video footage with uh, bad driving for us, and they're asking for cam recording footage. So it's a case of retrospectively, they can make an, they can, they can detect the 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 crime. Uh, um, I take I take on board um, you know civil rights and all that, but I mean we move into a stage now where, in, in particular, the major crime CCTV is an invaluable tool to the police, and uh, we should take it on board and, and fund it. I don't know where we're going to get it from, but you take for Swansea the regeneration of Swansea at the moment. I'm hoping that um, the 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 steps have been taken to to build this. CCTV into that setup. I mean, the commissioner for David Powers, you know, uh, last year, for instance, had his, his priority to increase CCTV and they've introduced it in Tlaleshley. So that's been a very good scheme. I don't know much about it myself, but I mean, a lot of research needs to be done and pull it all together and bring a report back to us to tell us where we go in as next steps. I think that the, the last point is the is the um, the crucial one. Um, the situation in David Pass is different because uh, there were significant cuts that were made during the uh, period of the previous police and crime commissioners. So the, uh, there's a question of sort of risk, uh, putting things back to um, where they were before. I think, um, it, you know, my one sentence description of the history is that an awful lot of investment in CCTV was made in in the late 90s and the uh, first two or three years of this century. But that means that an awful lot of the equipment is more than 20 years out of date. Uh, a lot of it doesn't meet evidential uh, uh, quality requirements um, in terms of the of the courts. It doesn't mean it's useless, but it's not as useful uh, as if it's uh, high tech. Some of it has to be <clears throat> 
uh, access to um, including private sector <coughs> um, uh, CCTV has to be accessed in quite clunky ways, uh, whereas more modern systems can be downloaded in the way that you uh, described, Councillor Evans. So I think this is all part of the uh, discussion that uh, that Peter is leading and all the experience of local authorities as well as police experience and the experience of people like the cam uh, surveillance commissioner uh, are being played into that. So, you know, to return to your last point, yeah, we need all of this digested uh, and uh, we will keep the panel informed. Thank you, Commissioner. I've got no other indications. I suppose my question really would be a pertinent one. Um, given that the ageing uh, um, uh, state of the equipment, to be perfectly honest with you, that is currently in operation, certainly in Bridgend, and I would suggest probably in other areas as well, what would you envisage as a timescale for this project? No, we wanted to move on this as quickly as possible. Peter may be able to give an idea of the timescale, but it partly depends on our partners and the availability of funding uh, streams. And there's a big difference uh, between uh, the quality of equipment in different places as well. Uh, variations within authority area very often, um, but uh, if I'm going to say some authorities have been more uh, ambitious than others um, to improve the quality and squeeze out the benefits. Peter? Absolutely, yes. Um, in terms of the, the timeline, we're looking at tw this is a 12 month project. So, you know, I highlighted the sh uh, some of the short term and the longer term ones, but certainly by 12 months, we'll hopefully have a, a specification, you know, in terms of, of what that would look like. The funding, uh, the funding model in place. Uh, you know, I mentioned that recently, you know, Merthyr had over 300,000 for CCTV. So we'll we'll actively over the next 12 months look at capital sources. But certainly I would hope by this time next year that we would have uh, a model that everybody is signed up to. And it's clear who's paying for what, the replacement time of technology, because the cost is coming down. But of course, technology gets obsolete more quickly. So getting on to a, a rolling program of of, of when equipment should be replaced, how much, I think will be an, another key um, objective. But as I said, 12 months from now, I would hope that all that would be um, completed. Thank you for that, Peter. Sure. Uh, can, I, can I just ask a question, please? Sorry, my button doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, OK. Peter, this is a straightforward question, really. You know, in your involvement with all the leaders from the local authorities and obviously Southwest Police, etc., do you have a feel that there is genuinely an appetite for this project to succeed? Are they prepared to accept the risk involved? Obviously, with all the stuff that's been discussed, the changes in technologies, the resourcing, et cetera, that there really is at the heart of it all, a genuine feeling that we want this to move on and, and, and to get into our core business. I'll be very candid with you. Uh, no, I don't think we are there yet. I think in some authorities we are, in others that we're not. I think that stems from the fact that the benefit and the financial contribution that's currently being made, because as I said, the police don't pay for this. I think there's um, we're not all, we're not all on the same page in terms of benefits to the community and linking that to financial contributions. I'd say we have it in 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 three or four, but not the seven. So I think one of the objectives of this group is to get everybody aligned. I'm not saying that will be an easy job, but I think that the group has to set itself that task to fully articulate the benefit of data, the benefit of CCT and, and communicate that. Um, and we can learn from best practice as well. So, again, 12 months down the line, I would hope that we've got consistency of thinking across all seven. And that's the strength of the approach that Peter's taking on my behalf, which is uh, not of policing saying we ask you to contribute this, but saying let's work it through together. Uh, and, and I think that's absolutely um, crucial. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. It's OK. I'm sure that's the right approach, Commissioner. I've not got any other speakers. So can I move on then? Oh, before. Uh, can I can I have someone to move that we uh, note the report, please? I'll move that. Move. Yeah. Thank you so right. much. I'm yeah, all happy to second. 
that. We all agreed with that. So can I move on to the annual report, please? Uh, uh, can, can I um, help you, Chair, in the spirit uh, that um, I, I promised to undertake at the beginning uh, uh, by introducing um, items 8, 9 and 10 together? Um, <clears throat> we have... I'd be very grateful, report. Commissioner. Sorry? I'd be very grateful. Yeah. Um, we have the annual report. It's a substantial document. Uh, I actually think it's quite a good read. Uh, and I particularly like to thank uh, Lee Jones for uh, his attention to detail in pulling uh, all three of these reports and the members of, uh, of the team that have supported him in that. As I say, I think it's a good read. Uh, but uh, many aspects of that good read are things on which we've reported in detail to the panel uh, on previous occasions or indeed uh, as part of the report today. I therefore don't feel a need uh, to draw uh, the attention of the panel to anything uh, specific, but just ask the, uh, the panel to uh, uh, note or perhaps even welcome uh, the annual report and the depth that it's gone into, uh, and obviously to raise any questions that um, concern the panel. Um, in, in a way, the other two come behind that quite naturally. Um, the scrutiny and oversight activity. Um, scrutiny and oversight is always uh, the stuff that is vitally important when something goes wrong. If you haven't done it, uh, there's a great danger uh, of uh, running into significant problems, and we've all seen that across the world. Uh, it, sometimes, uh, and this has certainly been the case uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned with both of the chief constables that I've had the pleasure of working with, <coughs> I've got immense uh, confidence in the uh, chief constable and the chief officer team and the direction in which they've travelled indeed over the, over the past eight years. Uh, and that can lead you to thinking, well, the scrutiny and oversight isn't as important. Two big things. They're absolutely crucial in order to make sure that uh, things that uh, need to be accounted for are accounted for and uh, that you're not lulled into a false sense of security and misplaced uh, confidence. Um, and secondly, we're traveling a journey where I believe the quality of the scrutiny has improved uh, uh, considerably over uh, a period of, of time. <laughs> uh, the matters scrutinised uh, have gone through a uh, positive trajectory, but also that scrutiny is increasingly seen by the Chief Constable, uh, by the Deputy Chief Constable in particular, and by Assistant Chief Constables as being an essential part of what they do, rather than an imp imposition. In other words, I've had a number of comments in the uh, past few months uh, from chief officers saying uh, we had a really good session on the ethics. We had a really good session uh, with the uh, with the audit committee. We had a really good session, uh, scrutinised the, the, this aspect of uh, what we're doing, and it's led us to be more ambitious <coughs> with things we take forward. So that's uh, scrutiny and oversight activity is having the uh, desired impact. And then finally, public engagement. I think in the, at the end of the day, if the engagement with the public on the part of the uh, operational policing team uh, is all that it uh, should be, uh, then uh, uh, it, uh, uh, that's what's important. Uh, and in a sense, the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner uh, should be important, uh, should deliver, uh, but almost be invisible because it's what people see from their local policing team that is the most important aspect. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier in the report on COVID, I think the, uh, that engagement is first rate and that has been reflected by comments from members of the panel. But nevertheless, we need to and have a legal obligation uh, to under, undertake engagement. And some of those engagements uh, in the local walkabouts and particularly the way uh, that uh, 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 electronic communications have been utilised to massively increase uh, the uh, number of people that we reach. Uh, again, that's been a positive that has taken place during COVID. And then my final one is the uh, independent custody visiting scheme uh, linked to the animal welfare uh, scheme. Again, 
the 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 way we treat people who have to be held in custody um, is an, an absolutely crucial test of uh, a civilized society. And again, with uh, CCTV in the uh, custody suite and the quality of uh, supervision that there is, uh, I think we can be pretty confident in it. But it's again important not to relax. Uh, and uh, I think a, a word of thanks is uh, due to the members of the public uh, who contribute as uh, custody visitors and scrutiny visitors. Um, so with, with that introduction, Chair, I think I'd be very happy for us to go to, um, uh, to questions, most of which Lee will answer, uh, I, I suspect. Um, uh, but and, and then perhaps we may just make a couple of uh, final comments uh, at the end. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Uh, as you did outline, the, the whole report has been uh, sent to members of the panel beforehand, so I thank you for your brevity. Can I invite panel members now to indicate if they would like to ask a question uh, on the previous, uh, previously um, um, uh, circulated reports? At the moment, I'm, 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 I haven't got anybody indicating. Um, no, that's good. On that basis, then, can I can I ask someone to move the four reports as we have taken them as a group? Chair, can, I, can I interrupt at this stage? The um, the annual report is one of the um, yearly statutory requirements to fall upon the panel. Uh, what the uh, police reform social responsibility act says is that we must review the uh, the report uh, as soon as the commissioner uh, provides it to us. He did that on the 7th of September. And mm. basically what we need to um, to report now is whether or not you agree the contents of the report. And if you do, are there any uh, recommendations? So I think you need to take a vote on that. Uh, yes. is, is, is the report agreed? Um, and are there any recommendations? Can I ask a question, Simon? Uh, Will we have to take each individual item individually, or can we can we decide the matter on all three reports? No, I, I suggest you do uh, item number eight first. Just just vote on that, and then you can do the other three together. Then. Okay, happy to do that. On that basis, can I have someone to uh, move that uh, we note the annual report? So moved, Chair. Thank you. And seconded, of course. Seconded. Thank you. Can I ask you, are you all in agreement? Yes. 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 Thank you for that. On that basis, can I ask you, I'll take them individually, I might just as well. Uh, item 9, scrutiny and engagement report. Can I have a mover, please? Yeah. And a seconder? Yes. yes. All agreed? Yeah, yes. Thank you. And item number 10, independent custody visiting report. Can I have a move, please? Yes. Yeah, happy. Okay. Seconded? Yes. All agreed? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item 11. Any other business deemed urgent by the chair? I can tell you now that I had no urgent business. Uh, that has been uh, flagged up to me on that basis. And yeah, I, I just raised one. It's the uh, request from the Commissioner's Office to um, set a new date for the precept meeting. Ah, uh, yes. We did discuss this, obviously, uh, in the pre-meeting. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether you want to deal with that as as AOB. Yes, I'm happy to do that. Chair, I think the there, case, was then, there was consensus around there that. There was, yeah. Chair, I, what, what, what we've got is a situation where the commissioner must report this precept to us by the 1st of February. Um, and we then have to meet before the 8th. We're taking out weekends. I think we were left with uh, a couple of dates in the first week of February. And um, I can see we had an agreement on the 3rd of February as being an appropriate day. Uh, I know everybody wasn't in the pre-meeting, but uh, if anybody has an issue with the 3rd of February, I propose that uh, we set that date as the new date for the precept meeting. Have we all agreed on that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, it suits me as well. So I'm quite happy to take that forward. 
I think that completes the agenda now. Uh, and on that basis, can I thank you, each and every one of you, for your attendance today and the time that you've thank taken. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Can I ask you, thank you so much, Commissioner? Uh, Sorry? Can I also thank the Commissioner for uh, helping the Chair in moving the agenda along? I, I, I do appreciate it. We've all got meetings to go to later on. So thank you so much, Commissioner. I, I think I'd just like to say that uh, I know how much work has gone into this and uh, I think I and Lee will interpret uh, the fact that we were able to deal with it expeditely uh, as a compliment to him on the quality of the work he's undertaken. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would second that, Commissioner. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Simon, can I ask you to stay in the line after the meeting, please? Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. And Thank you, everybody. Commissioner, Goodbye. Goodbye. keep oh, safe. Stop. Well yeah. done, Rich. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Yeah, you stay. I don't know.